Hello, everybody, and welcome to Unstoppable, the podcast with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And on this episode, I speak with Natalie McNeil. Natalie is an Emmy Award winning entrepreneur, author, speaker, and creator of the Conquer Club. She's also the CEO of She Takes on the World, and she did, and she won. She's appeared in the Forbes Top 100 Websites for Entrepreneurs, Top 100 Websites for Women, and has won the Website of the Year at the Stevie Awards for Women in Business. And this is one of the most inspirational female entrepreneurs living today. And I caught up with her recently to get all of her tips, insights, and tricks in her entire life story. This is one that you will not want to miss if you're learning to build a business, but especially if you're running in the female gene pool. Check this out. Listen up. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome to Unstoppable, Natalie McNeil. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Now, I feel like you align so well with what it is that we do because, you know, when I was doing my uh, my investigative research online about you, you know, she takes on the world, she has a conquer kit. You really do appear to be like an unstoppable young lady from uh, uh, North America who's taking over, the, or taking on, I should say, the rest of the world. <laughs> so for people who perhaps aren't familiar with the Natalie McNeil story, why don't you give us the, the 10, 12 second elevator of who you are? and why you are unstoppable. <laughs> <laughs> I am a Canadian entrepreneur now living in Los Angeles, truly committed to my own growth and development and also helping others to go through their own transformations and to be in their fullest capacity and fullest expression in this lifetime, which is I mean, not as, as easy as it sounds. <laughs> but it sounds like an incredible opportunity or an incredible purpose. Like you seem to be driven at such a high level. Like when, as I said, when I was doing my research on you online, you, you are a prolific writer. Like the amount of writing that you've done, you're also into interactive media. Uh, your, your roots are not just in transformation and change, but you also seem to be this incredible entrepreneur uh, who's done incredibly well in the area of business and media as well. So I'm curious to know, like where did this all begin? Like where did your journey begin? Uh, did it begin in Toronto, like at the, yeah. born at the age of three? I, I was the kid with the lemonade stand. No kidding. So you've always, been quite entrepreneurial always. from an early age. And even with the lemonade stand, it was never just lemonade. It was transformational me. lemonade. It was transformational <laughs> lemonade. Yeah. There was so much good juju in that lemonade. You know, I branched out into selling other things and I, I would be at this corner in my neighborhood and I started thinking, why am I staying here on this corner when there are only X number of people walking by every hour? What I could be doing is making my own little wagon cooler, I could be going door to door. I can Boom. hit so many more people if I, I just go door to door in an hour. I know. Oh my God. So I would knock on doors, this <laughs> little kid, blonde, um, like in the summer my hair would go bright blonde and I would be there and, and they would open up the door and I'd be like, hello, can I interest you in some lemonade because it is such a hot, humid day outside and I know you would love some lemonade and if you don't want lemonade I have other things too so you just tell me what you want I've got popsicles I've got fudge sickles so okay give me context how I, old are you at this point I was probably five or six wow. when I started my lemonade stand Holy and I took it very seriously mom would tell. bring me to the bank I would have my my bank book like a transactional book a yeah, checkbook yeah. I would make my deposit and I would keep my bank book updated. I was very focused on my revenue and profit margins even then. Wow. I, I actually feel a little bit reminiscent here. Like it took me a little <laughs> bit longer. I, I actually didn't have a lemonade stand, but at the age of 12, uh, I started selling manure door to door, but it was the exact same e manure. Manure, like yeah, and if you because if you can sell shit, you can sell anything. I right? was just gonna say that'll and teach the, you. How the to real sell. question would be is if because again, much like uh, your story, like I was with a friend, I was like, how do we make money to get to the local show to buy some show bags? And I said, well, we should sell horseshit door. We should sell horseshit. He's like, everybody sells horseshit. Like the, everyone has a lemonade stand. <laughs> and I said to him, this is my response. Yeah, but not everyone takes it door to door. Let's get a, let's get a wheelbarrow. We'll take, and you know, the question is how much would you pay to get rid of a 12 year old at your door who's sitting there with a wheelbarrow full of manure? Exactly. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Yes. So you started at the age of five. <laughs> That's quite impressive. That really is impressive. And so what, how, how did you then express, were you good at school? Like did this cross over into school? Were you quite a little academic I, and a little entrepreneur as well? Bit of an all-rounder? Yes. Yeah, I always did very well in school, but I always got very bored in school too. Right. So I went to this 
programmed to this school that I, I got to go there maybe once or twice a week. And it was, they called it an enrichment program. And it was there that I got to start playing with cameras and media and computers. So right. my school at the time didn't have a computer lab. Okay. And this other school that I got to go to had computers. We had camcorders where we were encouraged to make videos and to edit them on the, the old school Macintosh computers. And that's what got me really interested in media. I was so fascinated by it. And then in my teenage years too, I had a, I had a stationary business. So around the age of 11, I started selling custom stationary when people still used to write cards and handwritten notes. And I would do their address on the envelope and create custom stationary products for them. So I had a lot of little ventures growing up, had a babysitting business, ran a summer camp as a teenager. Wow, so what so was the, things. like at this age, <laughs> most kids are, you know, they're, they're number one drivers, you know, playing with the kid up the street, you know, uh, going to the local skate park. Like what was driving you at such a young age to be so entrepreneurial? I've thought a lot about that to try to pinpoint it. And we, did you grow up in a low socioeconomic area? Like, we, was, was, was the void of money breeding this value of, oh, well, I want what I don't have? I remember feeling that as a child. So my parents had me at a very young age and my dad had a job and we, you know, we, we were a middle-class family when I was in my teenage years. I remember my parents, the way that they would talk about money though, and I remember there being some feelings of fear. I remember as a child feeling like I needed to be making money just in case. Like if my mom was stressed out about money, that would stress me out too. And I don't know if that was the driver, but I think it had something to do with it. And I also feel like I always just had this, I had this drive to create something and to actually pursue my ideas. And I just, I loved making money as a kid too. And I loved having responsibility and I loved trying things and I didn't feel challenged in school. Mm. And business to me felt like it was where I got that challenge and where so many of my learnings were growing up. So you graduated high school? Yes. Okay, and then what was the plan from there? Was the plan to go to university or college, get a degree? What was, what was I was gonna go to law school because wow. when I was in high school, my guidance counselor, when I told her that I wanted to start my own business, yeah. I wanted to run my own company, she encouraged me to consider something like accounting or being a doctor or being a lawyer because I did really well in school. And then I took a test at school. It was a software program that told you what you should be when you grow up. And I remember taking this test. This was in the 10th grade. And I remember closing so about 15 years my of age eyes. at this point? I would be about 15, yeah. okay. yes. And I'm closing my eyes and I'm like, oh, please be business owner, business owner, business owner. <laughs> and the result comes back and it is circus performer. Wow. Number one, number two, lawyer. And I thought, well, I'm not gonna be a circus performer because I don't know what I would do in the circus. Like I don't have any circus related talents. So I guess a lawyer won't be so bad. And I convinced myself that being a lawyer would not, would not be so bad. I watched movies like Legally Blonde. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, huh, Elle Woods, I can do that. <laughs> Elle Woods seems to be having a lot of fun as a lawyer. So I can do that. I can have my own practice. That's still kind of being an entrepreneur and, and running my own business. And then it wasn't until I got to university. I went to a very entrepreneurial university and I was doing a business and political science. Good degree to get before going to law school. And I started a business in university. And I started getting into marketing and to media. And what I What was the business I that you knew. started? I did a few things okay. <laughs> as per usual with me. I was mostly doing uh, marketing and customer experience auditing. So I would be contracted by a company to go and I did this for a lot of cell phone companies at the time. 
I would go in, I would pretend, I would have this persona that I would be in, and I would be ordering new internet service or buying a, a cell phone and then auditing the whole experience and evaluating that customer service representative and then presenting it to presenting it to the company right. so that they could make improvements to their customer experience. It's almost like the mystery shopping. Almost like mystery yeah. shopping, yes. Okay. And I did that. I also was taking on marketing consulting clients because I was starting at the end of university, this is at the very end, I had already started writing online. And people started asking me how they can leverage social media, how they can start doing online marketing. There were so many businesses that had no idea what to do. And those were some of my first clients. Yeah, right. And then I met my former business partner and I started working on interactive media projects with him. And that's how I got into the interactive media space. Right at That was right at the end of university, the year that I graduated. So for someone who doesn't know the difference between interactive media and normal media, how would you yes. describe it? Interactive media, the, what we were doing were highly immersive experiences, a lot of second screen experiences for, let's say, a television show. So a television show would be airing and then they would have a, an experience online that was highly interactive that supported the promotion of the TV show, or we sometimes did standalone projects or 360 degree documentaries, and we, we got to play a lot. There was a lot of research and development at the time. Yeah, right. It was a lot of experimentation. It was a pretty new industry. So what year was this? This would have been roughly 2008. Yeah, right. 2008 is when I started working with him and then a couple years later, we merged and formed a new company called Imaginarius. And that's when we started creating more of these uh, 360 degree film projects and, and really uh, interactive. The, the best way I can describe it is a 360 degree, almost like virtual reality. Yeah. But virtual reality wasn't what it is today. And so we were creating some of those first experiences. It, it felt like what we were doing was highly innovative and really ahead of the yeah, curve. Yeah, 2008, that was like right where it was happening. Yes. And so at what point did you start feeling the pull that there was something more out there for you? More in terms of Well, in terms of media the, or? Well, in terms of life, because mm -hmm. I, I get the sense that you've, you started very strongly in media. You had a very strong, you're, you're, you're this entrepreneur who used media as a vehicle to express her talents. But then as I, you know, as I said, as I, as I look at you online now, I see like this, this woman who's a prolific author, prolific entrepreneur, but I also see this, this spiritual side, this, this human side, this side that is incredibly driven by a purpose that is bigger than just making money. So I'm curious at what point like the, the, the itch started to come in that there was something bigger out there. Because I'm, I'm curious at this point, like what was, were you conscious of what was driving you at this point? Was it a, was it a money equation at this point or was it the, an entertainment or was it at this point you knowing that this was going to be the prelude to something bigger? Yeah, I love this question because it's something I've been reflecting on a lot. So in 2008, which is the year that I graduated, so you did graduate, I, you finished? I did end up yeah. finishing school. There was part of me that didn't want to because I had all these other things going on and I just thought, F finish it up. So I did a few semesters in a row, took extra classes so that I could get it done a little early. And during that time, I was also traveling a lot. So the other thing about me is that I've, I've traveled extensively around the world. I've been to about 100 countries and I traveled a lot when I was younger and when I was just out of school. So I was traveling while also building this, this business and I started She Takes on the World in 2008. So when you started She Takes on the World, that was just a blog, was it? It was just a little blog yep. where I wrote about my experiences building a business and traveling the world and whatever else I wanted to talk about. And that started to take on a life of its own. And it was such a strong pull for me to create that website. And when the idea came in, I knew that I had to do it right away. And I had the name come to me in a dream. So middle of the night, I, in my dream, am seeing this website, She Takes on the World. And I wrote notes in, I had a Blackberry at the time, 
I'm from the city where BlackBerry was invented. So I had a BlackBerry for many, many years before switching to an iPhone. And on my BlackBerry, I wrote these, these notes in the middle of the night. And it wasn't until later on that day. So I woke up, did not recall this dream. Later that day, I had this thought that I had a really profound dream last night. And I usually recorded my dreams. So I checked my notes in my BlackBerry and sure enough, there was all, all the details of the dream. And I was like, yes, this is amazing. She takes on the world. And then I ended up starting it right away on Blogspot. When that took on a life of its own, a lot of media outlets started to approach me to write about the things that I was writing about on She Takes on the World. And that's when I started to build an audience there. Right. And then the book deal came a few years later. And eventually, She Takes on the World had so much momentum after the book. And I was speaking at more events. And I was writing columns. I decided to shift my focus and dedicate, dedicate all of my time to that and to scaling it and to building it out. And that was back in 2011, 2012. Those were my transition years from what I was doing in media into focusing on She Takes on the World. And then, like you said, I've had some books written. The spiritual side, that has also been something rooted in in all of my travels. So when I was... Is it that searching, like you were searching, like the traveling was about you searching for something? Like I know for me personally, I think it was the age of 28. Um, after getting out of a joint, uh, getting out of, I think it was my second or my third business, had a little bit of money. I said, I'm going to go and travel the world. But I was looking for something. Almost like I was looking for, I remember when I was in Machu Picchu, I was, I was waiting for some little Peruvian monk to just like roll out <laughs> from behind a, a giant rock and go, hmm, I've been waiting. And, you know, for me, that never happened. And it wasn't until I got back that I realized what I'd been looking for was actually right in front of me or inside me the whole time. So I'm curious, like, when you started this pursuit of travel, like, was there something inside you that was, was searching for experiences or was it for searching for a knowledge or searching for a knowing or a purpose? What I realized in some of my early travel experiences was that being in a new place, going and getting lost somewhere is how I was finding parts of myself and connecting to parts of myself that I did not know before. And I see that with every person too. Every stranger was like a mirror and had something to offer me. And it was some of those early experiences of getting lost, of being in a new place and and having to figure out how to get around and communicating with people who may not speak English and connecting with people's humanity and with their beliefs and how they move through their day. It, It opened something in me. And I feel like I got to know myself through traveling. And that's why I continue to just travel and be in all these places and try try a lot of new things. So I, I remember one of my first meditation experiences as a teenager, I was traveling through Asia and I found myself in this monastery with these monks that were deep in meditation and they invited me to meditate with them and I, I did not last very long. It was like 60 seconds and I thought, I'm, I'm done with this. <laughs> and they invited me to to come back and to try again. And and they were teaching me that this practice of meditation and mindfulness. And I brought that into every area of my life. And I started meditating more regularly and just slowly built up, just adding 10 more seconds a day and 10 more seconds a day until I was doing these 30 minute meditations that I felt opened opened a lot within me, a lot of spaciousness. There was this clearing in that practice. So experiences like that got me hooked on traveling. I wanted more. I wanted to come to know myself more deeply, more fully, more wholly through others. So this travel, so you weren't doing, this isn't Kentucky tours. Like this is literally (laughs) dropping yourself into places where in some cases, I'm gonna assume there was an enormous amount of discomfort you know, not speaking the language, not knowing you are, getting yourself lost deliberately. So do you think the discomfort played a big role in the, in, in the formulation of, of, of what that brought out in you? 100%. That is where all the magic happens. We have, to, we have to go into 
the void. We have to go into the discomfort to birth new things, to know ourselves deeper, and to really open ourselves to all, all of what life has to offer. And there were so many challenges that came up in those travels. There were times that I ran out of money. There were times that I was like sleeping on a train or fell asleep on a train and missed my stop. There were times when I got myself into situations where I was very scared and wasn't sure what was going to happen next. And all of those experiences gave me so much. There was, there was a gift in every one of them, even when it was uncomfortable. And I think too many of us, we don't want to feel anything that we would label as negative or painful or sad or uncomfortable. And there's so much in those experiences for us when we allow ourselves to just feel on the whole spectrum. That's the, that is the human experience. And I want to see as much of the world with my own eyes while I'm here. It's interesting, we hear so many different, it's, look, it's in scriptures, even Buddha himself said, the greater the pain, the greater the awakening. And you hear so many people talk about their own stories of pain and, uh, and trauma that gave birth to, in many cases, you know, new beginnings and new purposes. So why do you think still so many people, you know, are so afraid of doing things that are uncomfortable when we know either consciously or unconsciously for some others that this is actually the path that is required to be taken in order to really find who we are? A lot of people that I talk to feel like they will get lost in it. They feel like when they go into the discomfort or the sadness, it feels like such a black hole that they're not sure they can ever get out. And I think part of, part of it for me of leaning into that discomfort has been knowing that there are gifts in it and also so much resilience. And you only learn that resilience by, by going, going in. in. And once people figure out that they can go in and they will get out of it, that this too shall pass, it becomes easier, I think, to go in it, to go into it again in the future. But I mean, people don't want to take time. People say, I, I don't have time to feel terrible. I don't have time to be in this place of feeling sadness or feeling pain. It's going to distract me from all these other things that I'm doing. And people, people don't want to feel it all. So it, it's so uncomfortable. I know you're big on routines. Like, do you have a routine? Like when you're feeling discomfort, because um, again, most people's impulse reaction is either consciously or unconsciously. Okay, this feels bad. I'm out of here. But I think once people start getting on the journey and realizing that the pain, the resistance is what's required to you know, help us get to that next level, we start to go, okay, well, I, I've heard all the stories, you know, life lives on the, on, on the border, it lives outside of our comfort zone. So what do you do? Like when you're in discomfort, how do you rationalize it? Like what's the routine that perhaps you could give to someone else mm -hmm. that would help them stay there to be able to get the fruits that that, um, that, that experience gives people? Mm -hmm. I have a few practices. One of them is that I am always wanting to, striving to deepen my awareness. And one of the ways that I do that is I pretend that I'm sitting in a, in a theater space and I watch everything that's playing out on the screen. So how am I reacting? What emotions am I in right now? How, when I'm in that emotion, am I showing up in the world or in my relationship? So I like to just watch how everything is playing out and observe it because that helps me to have awareness around what's happening. And it helps me to separate myself from like being the emotion. That's the other thing. We are not these emotions. And there is a, our minds are like sky and these emotions like pass through like clouds. This was a concept that Osho talked a lot about. They aren't going, they're not staying there. They're just moving through and we just have to let them move through. Um, there's a poem, The Guest House by Rumi that I love as well. And letting every guest in, if sadness shows up, just like letting it in and knowing that it's just a guest and that guest will be on its way <laughs> soon. So I think having the awareness is really helpful. And then looking at your triggers and reworking those. And there are a few ways that you can do that. I find the work of Byron Katie to be very helpful in asking yourself, um, is this true? So if a judgment comes up, if 
you are reacting in from a place of fear asking yourself is this true so if i'm if i'm like wow this you know kerwin is is really driving me crazy today um looking at is that known to happen is that yeah. really true <laughs> <laughs> or i mean sometimes it's a lot sometimes yeah. it's a lot worse than this uh, i did one of these with a with somebody in my life where i was like this person is so lazy and looking at well is that true and how do i react when i'm believing that about that person mm. and what would i do if i wasn't believing that about this person and then doing these turnarounds so like where in my life am i being lazy and where i have that self judgment and this is the this is the work of byron katie which i find to be very helpful and then journaling and journaling through an emotion and everything that comes up around it i find to be very helpful as well and just feeling it all and if you feel it it will pass just like the clouds pass in it's, it's so nice to hear you say that because i think a lot of people when they feel that discomfort they think that there's something wrong and it's almost like when they feel uncomfortable they feel stress the first thing they go to is you know um, a behavior or a substance that helps them not feel what it is they're feeling or feel something different Whereas what you're suggesting is you know, be present to it, feel it. Be present to yeah, it. Yeah, allow it to float in. Play with it. Play with it and play with what those triggers are and those reactions are and recognize that you are not those emotions. It's just something that you are, that you have present for a period of time. Mm. And once you allow yourself to feel it, it, it dissipates. So I get the sense that like awareness is a, a, a huge part of your journey now. Consciousness is a huge part of your journey. Mm -hmm. Has it always played a role or has it started to play more of a role in recent times as you've got to know yourself more? I would say I have always had a self-awareness and have been able to look at, almost like zoom out and look at how I'm showing up in the world and how I'm reacting and how mm. things are triggering me. So I've always, for as long as I can remember, had somewhat of an awareness. Now, as you play with it, as you feel these, these emotions and like try them on, it becomes easier and easier to to get the gift in them and to see why they're showing up because there's always there's always something that's there for you. You know, everything is everything is mirroring our inner experience. So if I'm really pissed off at somebody, there is something in me being triggered that is mine to look at. Mm. If I am a trait within yourself that you haven't fully embraced or accepted. Exactly. As an yeah. Exactly. And for me, as I've as I've gone through my move and uprooted myself in this life I had created in Canada and planted myself in a brand new place, there were so many things that came up for me and so much transformation in this past year, especially. And with that, sitting with the self-judgment. So people that I used to think were weird or wild i find are some of my closest friends now <laughs> you know there's there are a couple women in my life and i used to think wow she's she's a little wild and when i took that on and i looked at what it was triggering in me it was triggering this pain around not being connected to that myself which i am i am definitely connected to now and it was a part of myself that I just wasn't owning and that I had a lot of self-judgment around. Yeah, right. I wasn't letting myself be that. I felt like I had to show up and perfection was very important to me for a very long time. Doing things perfectly, being so nice, like trying to be the perfect friend and the perfect sister. And I just, I wanted to be the perfect business owner as well. And you start to you start to create a facade. I started to create a facade. I was so I was so focused on on keeping keeping up with this image that I had created and this brand that I had created. I felt like I could not step out of that. Right. I remember the first time I remember the first time swearing on stage, 
And there were a few people that were like, <gasps> wow, that seemed really off brand for you. There were a few people that were shocked. And if you had encountered me in my day-to-day -day life, that's, that's how I would have been speaking. And yet I had this like image mm. that I, I was upholding and, and creating, especially in the earlier days of my brand. And once I let all of that go, and I let go of that need to be perfect or to show up as anything but who I am in the moment, it was so liberating. Mm. And even now, I would rather somebody's truth than for them to, to say that they're fine. How many of us say, oh, I'm, I'm fine, I'm great. When we ask somebody, how are you? I'm fine. You know the acronym for fine is, I'm you? good, no. Fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. So whenever, yes. yeah, right. So anyone, how are you? I'm fine. fine. Really? I'm fine. You know what that means? Yeah. Let's and I that. would rather someone be like, you know what? I'm having a really shit day today. Yeah. Someone did this uh, to me a couple couple weeks ago. I was like, hey, how how are you doing today? How are you feeling today? And he was like, I am utter shit today, <laughs> in a British accent. And I was like. Thank you. Yeah. That's amazing. Like I can, I can work with utter shit. Thank yeah. you for being so honest. And I don't want to. I don't want to show know, up to anything. That in itself presents like an interesting challenge for a, like a, a new age personal development slash, you know, spiritually evolving individual where they're like, well, I want to be authentic, but at the same time, I need to be conscious of the language that I use because the language I use creates my world. So how do we distinguish between? <laughs> <laughs> it's like the fucking ultimate conundrum. <laughs> right? How do I be authentic, but at the same time, you know, conscious of the fact that my words are creating my reality? Because if I'm having a shit day and 20 people ask me, how am I doing? And I tell 20 people, I'm having a shit day. Surely that's going to compound <laughs> it. How do I balance authenticity and my own you know, linguistic ability to create my own life? I see it in my own experience as trying on an outfit as I'm in that day. So instead of Instead of moving into what I would consider to be like the perfect response, even though I am feeling this way, even though I'm having a shit day, I'm going to use my language to say, this is actually a beautiful day and there are so many gifts in this day. I will not go to that space until it feels true right. for me. And I think that we do this with other people too. We do this in relationships. We we bypass. We feel like we have to move to forgiveness right away. And I don't believe that. I believe that anger can be a very powerful emotion to be with and to channel into areas of your life. Not everything is love and light and rainbows and butterflies all the time. So the way that I see it, because our, our language does create our reality, I believe that the words that we use are everything. Mm. Like well, everything Masaru, are you familiar with Mar Masaru word? Moto's work mm. and his messages in water? Like it was really, it's profound when we start to understand that our, our words carry a vibration that affect the molecules in ourselves and also those around us. And I think when you temporarily step out of that, that kind of language, mm. seeing it as just trying on whatever you're experiencing can be really valuable. So if I, if I just want to be in my bad day for a couple hours, I'll see it like I'm trying on an outfit. And I will give myself a couple hours to just play with that and to to also identify where it's triggering something maybe from earlier in my life and to play with that. And I, I have amazing friends around me who are coaches and one of my best friends is a transformational coach who is also one of the best therapists that I know. And having friends like that where you can show up exactly as you are and they'll play with you in that space mm. is amazing. So just showing up like you are wearing this outfit and after doing that for a couple hours, I get sick of it. So when I try on my bad day outfit and I go out into the world that way with my attitude and with my, my beliefs that this is a really terrible day, after a couple hours, I'm so ready to step out of that and to step back into how I would usually operate. That's a beautiful description, but to me, and I don't like to use the word but, however, 
I'm curious, it almost seems like there's a level of awareness that's required to play that game. And it seems like you've had this uh, evolving level of awareness throughout your life. You've always been aware that you've had this level of almost like self-observation, this ability to observe self. But it's almost like I think there are some people that are only just being introduced to the concept of self-awareness, the concept of consciousness. So how do you teach that to someone who's perhaps, they're like, okay, I know I'm relatively unconscious. I know I need to become more aware if I want to start having a more enriched life and you know, being less attached to the things, the emotions and the experience I'm having. Like, do you have any routines to help people become more conscious? Like, how do you teach consciousness? Oh, how and again, I know you're not Osho, but have a crack anyway. I really believe it's in the practice of it. And the practice of trying something on without fully identifying it and seeing it as you. And even just the fact that we're having this discussion right now, even the fact that these words are hitting your ears right now for everyone listening, is expanding your awareness. And with that expanded awareness, you will, and with that seed planted, you will start thinking about it differently. The next time you are upset or angry or judging yourself or others, that seed is planted now and you will think, okay, what is, what is this really? What is this triggering for me? And it, it's just a practice. It's the practice of awareness. And the stage technique that I mentioned is also very helpful to be able to take a second to just stop and for a couple minutes, imagine this playing out on a movie screen and visualizing yourself stepping out and just watching what's playing out and seeing if you notice anything. It's just looking at whether you notice anything. If you don't notice anything at all that seems out of place or that is a trigger for you or a way that you're reacting that may not be for your highest good, that's okay too if you don't notice anything. I bet you'll notice something though. You'll notice something there will be that there will be that awareness that wasn't present before. Do you have so a it's relationship? Just starting small. Do you have a relationship with meditation at all? Yes. Do you meditate on a regular basis? Yes. Has that been a uh, an evolving a, 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 a part of your practice or your routines that has become uh, more important as the as you have done it more and more? Yeah, and meditation for me is <laughs> is how I move through the world now. It used to be that I needed to sit for a long time in meditation and carve that out in my day. And now I feel like I can be taking a walk and that walk is meditation. So to you, that's some light. mindfulness, that's meditation for you? Yeah, and I think that for people listening, taking a few minutes every day, I don't like giving people more than that to start because I'd rather you do it. I'd rather you sit for 60 seconds and take some deep breaths than to feel like you have to sit for 20 minutes and then you're constantly saying, well, I don't have 20 minutes right now. So just a few minutes and deep breathing. I do a lot of breath work and rhythmic breathing to move energy through my body. And then when I'm in meditation, I'll sit with anything that's triggering me. I'll, I'll sit with that, that movie screen technique and watch what's playing out. And that kind of mindfulness and awareness meditation is very powerful mm. for further developing your awareness. The breath work that I do, and there's, there, there are so many different breath work techniques that you can use now, that changes your state. Like movement changes your state. If you are feeling, if you're feeling like you have low energy or you're feeling sad or mad or any any of those those emotions doing breath work can really shift your state especially if you need to then go to work or or have a conversation with that person if you're if you're fighting with somebody if you're like with a partner and you're fighting i think one of the best things you can do is a little bit of breath work and then come back to that conversation and you can, I, I do a lot of breath of fire, which is short, shallow breaths in through the nose, breath, out yeah. through the nose. So, <laughs> and I'll do that for a minute and then take a few really deep breaths. And, and that breath, 
that breathing technique, breath of fire, is only nostril breathing. So it's in through the nose, out through the nose. And then a few deep breaths at the end, like in through the nose and out through the mouth. Do that for a minute. You will feel so, so different. It's powerful. Uh, Wim Hof has some great you breathing techniques. Was just reading my mind as yeah. well. Um, I find his it's a work great way to, to reset so helpful. and play with the autonomic nervous system and realize mm -hmm. that we can override it. We can, we can, re we can hit a reset button. We sure can. Now yes. you've got a book coming out. I hope it was okay to mention this. Is it the the, the forty four? Fall twenty nineteen. Fall twenty nineteen. It's a little, little far away. Yeah. And what is it called? The rituals. The rituals, and it's forty four rituals. 44 rituals and practices to transform your life. So rituals, I'm going to assume, play a massive part of your life. Like yes. when I look at, at your work, when I look at your the Conquer Kit, when I look at all of your articles, like there is so much structure to what you do. <laughs> it's always the five way to do this, the 13 ways to do that. And I love that because I think structure, you know, when we have a structure and we apply discipline to it, that gives us the ability to increase the probability of a habit taking place. Yeah. And if we can make our behaviors habitual, then they become autonomous and we enjoy an, a state of effortless flow. But it's that beginning bit. It's where, you know, where we form those habits that for most people, we fall down. But with the work that you've done, what are some of the most important routines that you've discovered that are critical when it comes to whether it be just enjoying life or increasing the probability of success, whether it be in a relationship or in a, or, you know, a commercial enterprise? When I get up in the morning, I always have to move my body and I always have to do some breath work. That's how I start every day. It shifts my state. It wakes me up. And I usually set intentions even before my eyes open in the morning and I'll start moving my body. Movement, exercise, I think that is one of the most powerful tools that we have to, st to change our state. Like our physiology is so important to be able to go out and do all the things we wanna do in the world as entrepreneurs. So that's the way that I start every day very healthy diet. I think a lot about food. And food for me is a mindfulness practice as well. It's an opportunity to, to connect with this. Food is, is part of our everyday life. And we can have our tea, we can have our coffee, we can have our food and be thinking about where it came from. So when I'm, when I'm having my tea, I am meditating on it, which is a, a practice that I learned at a tea ceremony in China. And I'm thinking about the tea leaves and the flavors and like keeping it in my mouth and just like, just feeling the tea, feeling the warmth. With a, with a meal, same thing. I will take a moment to just be grateful for this food that is going to nourish my body and think about the farmers that were needed in that process of, of getting that food on my plate. The people whose, whose hands touched those vegetables and that salad I'm about to eat or the, the fishermen who caught the fish that I am about to have. So just reflecting on and this isn't a long process. This is, takes, you know, 15 to 20 seconds, but it's connecting with the food and, and just setting the intention for that food to nourish me. So bringing more mindfulness to everything that we, that we do, it connects us. It, it connects us to, it connects us to each other and the world. And also I think connects us to ourselves in a, deeper way. So those are some of my practices that I start the day with. And then I have little rituals that come into play. Do you do 44 every day? So many. No, no, no. Okay. No, those are practices that some of them I might do once a year. Like mm. one, some of them I might do just on my birthday or just at the beginning of a new year. For example, um, an augury. Augury is a ancient Roman practice where omens would be deciphered throughout the day. And 
my uh, dear friend Layla Martin and I, we started our year this way in a very differently formatted augury for us, but we spent the day, we spent New Year's Day going through all the things that we want, all the ways we want to feel for the year ahead. So this is an example of one of the rituals that you would just do at the beginning of a new cycle or season. And in that day, we spent time in nature, we danced, we read some books, we were in Sequoia National Park and we went on this beautiful hike and we were like in nature and felt so alive and we were planning things and we we then went and checked into the Beverly Wilshire at this into this amazing suite and we had massages and went to the spa so we we wanted to feel grounded and we wanted to feel connected and that was the nature part for us and then as we moved through that day we incorporated experiences that would allow us to feel the things that we want to feel and then we ended with luxury and feeling really uh, nourished so like looking at ritual. everything we wanted for the year and putting it all into one day wow, that's like that's an that. augury and you don't have to do it at the beginning I of the like year either that. and you listen wow. to and pay attention to all the signs too so in sequoia we had these two deer come to us while we were meditating in this sequoia tree so we pay attention to things like that like what what does that mean Wow, I like that. What is that? What so is that I, I noticed you've also written a book called The Conquer Kit, which from my understanding, is all about planning. Is that right? The Conquer Kit is a creative business planning workbook. Okay. So for me, one of the most powerful routines that I work with myself, that I work with my clients, is the routine of planning and the rhythm of planning. And you know, I think a lot of people just do planning once. They, they treat it like an event, you know, like a diet. They do it once and they hope that it carries on for the rest of their life. <laughs> But I'm curious to know, in terms of your planning routines, how much of a role has that played in the success that you're now experiencing as an entrepreneur? Entrepreneurs need to plan. You've got to plan. So how do you do and it? Like, What's your routine? What's your rhythm? It has to feel, and this is where the Conquer Kit comes in, it has to feel playful for me. It has to feel creative. I don't want to create a plan and then put it in a drawer and not look at it. I want my plans to be beautiful. I want to put them on my wall. I want to feel connected to them. And so the Conquer Kit is, is this creative workbook where you are encouraged to draw and paint and use stickers and glue and whatever else you wanna use to create your plans. So my plans are usually almost a cross between a, a vision board and more of a strategic plan with milestones and very clear deadlines. It always starts out on paper for me. I always plan first on paper, really big post-it notes, lots of color, and then I start to break it down and put it into a system like Asana. Yeah, and right. I revisit my plans all the time. I look at what I'm working toward, and right now I have a Vision 2020 plan, so it's what we're doing over the next 24 months. I look at that every single day. It's on my wall, it's not in a drawer somewhere. And I need that as my North Star. I need to keep in mind where I'm going and make sure that every day I'm doing something that will matter in 2020. Every day I'm doing something that contributes to that bigger vision that I have. And time is our most precious resource. So when I have my week planned out and my week is always planned out by Sunday, I never wake up in the morning and think, what am, I, what am I going to do today? What do I need to get done today? The day is always planned the night before, the week is always planned by Sunday. So by Sunday, I have an idea of everything coming up for the week, so that when I wake up in the morning, I set my intention, I go through my practices so that I feel amazing, and I feel energized, and then it's, it's hit the ground running. So when you plan, typically how far do you plan out? Like do you do like a 10 year plan and then reverse engineer it five years? You're talking right now, you're doing a 2020 plan? Yes. For 24 months? So I have the bigger vision. So yeah. that's my bigger picture plan. Okay. And then it always gets broken down into sprints. Right, and so what do they look like? The sprints are always 12 weeks for me. Yeah. Eight weeks works for some people. Mm -hmm. 16 weeks works for some people. 12 weeks is our sweet spot. And for those 12 weeks, we are very focused on one maximum two things. Right. And with those one or two priorities, 
I'll break that down into milestones. So at the end of every week, here are milestones we're hitting. And then within that, here's the thing that I think a lot of people, that a lot of people don't necessarily get right or aren't sure how to do. It's breaking it down into small tasks. So in my Asana right now, there are over a thousand tasks for this sprint that we're going to do. So once you know the milestones that you have to hit, every task needs to be broken down to be, I don't like it more than 60 minutes. So a task is something that will take me 60 minutes or less to do. If a task is going to take me four hours and require a half day of my time, it's too broad. It's more of a milestone and needs to be mm. broken out further. So when I'm schedule, scheduling everything in Asana, if I have a sales email sequence as an example, a task would be write the draft of email one, add images for email one, like what are the graphics that we need, write the final draft of email one, get that into Infusionsoft? Is it scheduled in Infusionsoft? I work with a lot of entrepreneurs who will put as a task, write sales email sequence. Great, that is a huge undertaking that is going to take you a long time. And if you don't have those specific tasks laid out, how are you going to ensure that that gets done? What's holding you accountable? So we break things down into very, very tiny pieces. Mm, that's beautiful. I love it. That's exactly what we do as well. So I'm curious, you've been, when did you release the Conquer Kit? That was in? That was 2015. 2015? It was a few years okay. ago, yeah. So you've been dealing with the planning process for a long time. You've been working with entrepreneurs. I've been a planner for a long time, yeah, yeah, for a decade. What are the biggest mistakes that you see a lot of people make when it comes to planning, apart from not planning? As part from not planning. Yeah. It's the not breaking things down mm -hmm. into small enough tasks. It is not having some type of accountability and feedback. So how loop. do you do your accountability? Like what is it that you would do to employ accountability when you're working with someone on a plan, from a planning perspective? Yes, if I'm working with a team member, they know their tasks. And so at the end of every week, we are checking in and making sure that all of those things did indeed get done. And if they didn't, looking at why and then rescheduling something. Right. And then for me, I'm accountable to my team members as well and to other stakeholders and people are waiting on things for me. One of the things I do in Conquer Your Year, which is the Conquer Kit broken down into week to week and yeah, broken right. down into the okay. sprints, is have a, I always have a running list of deliverables and receivables for a week. So things that I need to deliver that week, things I need to receive that week. And I like having that kind of inbox. The other thing is that people don't separate their priority list from their to-do list. These are two different lists that you need. Mm. There are the priorities, there are the three to five things in a day that I have to get done. Those are the things that matter for the bigger vision. Those are the things that are going to matter a year from now, two years from now. The to-do list are tasks, things that we usually have to give to other people, things that we need to respond Part to that life. require our attention. Yeah. Exactly. That is, that is not going to contribute to the overall vision. Yes, it helps the ship to continue to move forward, but priorities and, and to-dos need to be separated. My to-do list is never ending. When I check something off, I have three more things that I write in. Am I right? Like the to-do list. <laughs> Does anyone ever just yeah. completely clear their to-do list? But my priorities, those do get cleared every day. So every day, what are the three, it's usually three things that I need to do and I do those things first before moving on to my to-do list. And then the other thing that's part of my planning process is what I call balanced ambition. And any time I have been too caught up in achieving, in doing. There's an aliveness that is missing in that. And I, I don't want to stray into that ever again. So I am always taking on new things in my personal life. What's something that I want to try? I'm always trying something new or taking a new course. 
recently I've been doing sword fighting. I do acro yoga. I like play on the beach in Santa Monica. Play on the rings and the oh, you swings. Do. Yeah. I go biking every night and and usually get down to the water for the sunset. Those are things that make me feel alive. Those are things that connect me to me. Those are the things that help fuel me to be able to do the work that I do in the world. Another part of balanced ambition: relationships. So. What are your goals for your own joy and happiness? What are your goals for your relationships? How can you show up in those relationships differently, better, build deeper connections? What are the things you want to do for your health? Health is wealth. Like that is my focus. And if you don't have that, nothing else matters.、Mm. How do you deal with distraction? Distraction. You know, I read I an article recently. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> okay, because I read an article the other day. Actually, no, this is a couple of years ago,、uh, but I reviewed something that reminded me of this: that the average entrepreneur experiences about three hours of distractions every day. Now, when you compound that over a twelve-month period and you divide that by five, you know that's like a twelve to eighteen-week window that people are experiencing a life where they're distracted. And that's not just distraction. That's because distractions is one thing. But then you've got how do I recover from a distraction? Because most people, you know, that be, might be working on a piece of copy, or they might be working on a piece of content or an article, and then all of a sudden they get、yeah. distracted. If you've got a minute, the phone rings, and they're like, "Fuck, where was I? What was I doing?" And then they go, <laughs>、uh, "Facebook,、uh, Instagram." Right. So, like, do you have any routines that you use to either avoid distraction or recover from distractions quickly,、yes. so that, that they don't become bigger than they need to be? I love this. First of all, if I'm feeling distracted in a way that I- I'm just off for the day. Like I'm just not feeling it. If I can clear some things from my schedule and just step away, that usually makes all the difference in the world. Like we all wake up sometimes and we're just not feeling it, or we don't want to work. If I'm in that space, I'm not going to be able to work on my book. I'm not going to be able to write. I'm going to sit in front of the screen and not feel in my flow. So it's better for me to just take a few hours. To go and do something else, so to just allow the distraction. The ways that I avoid distraction: task switching is very dangerous because it takes the brain about 27 minutes, I believe, is the stat, to get back to the task. So, if I'm working on a chapter of my book and I'm writing, and my phone rings and I take that call, it will take my brain 27 minutes to get back into where I left off、wow. with that chapter. If you are working on copy or something that you need to be creating, and you have your inbox open and you see this email pop up and you go into the email, 27 minutes you're losing by going into the email and then coming back. So batching things is so critical for an entrepreneur because time is everything. That is the number one resource you always need to be managing as an entrepreneur.、Mm. Don't lose 27 minutes every time you switch tasks. So batch things. If you're writing something, make sure you give yourself enough time. Have a two to three hour block scheduled. When I do meetings or interviews, I do them back to back. Usually Mondays, I'm coaching and with private clients all day back to back. Wednesdays, I do meetings out of my office and do interviews. I always do those back to back. If I can, every once in a while, there's going to be something that comes up, and you just work with somebody else's schedule, and that's fine. But I try to batch everything as best I can, and that's an amazing way to avoid distractions. And I like this because one of the things that I'm really curious about, you know, again, when I look at your work, I'm like, wow, you really just pump out the content. You really do. <laughs> And is it you write? You do all your own content. You don't, do you ghost any of we, it? We no. We have a team、okay. that works with me. So I, I'm directing all of it, and I do write a lot and produce、yep. a lot of content. And I also have a copywriter who helps me with things, and will co-write some of the things in my business, and then have an editor look over it. So, what are some of the routines? Because again, one of the things that I hear from entrepreneurs, business owners. You know, they, they're conscious of social media. They're conscious of the importance of shit. I'm now in the media business, regardless if you're a baker, you、mm-hmm. know, or chiropractor or candlestick maker. You have to be, you know, being social. And the way that we become social is by producing content that is not n- just promotional. You know, that it is going to serve people's needs and, in some cases, give them results in advance and deliver value before they've even done business with us. 
So how do you create content in what appears to be so effortless? Is, is there a structure, is there a routine that you could perhaps share with us now that would give people a bit of an insight into how they could yes. accelerate the amount of content that they can produce for social media and other forms? Yes. Batching your content is also brilliant. Batching is brilliant. Remember that. <laughs> batching is brilliant. Batching is brilliant. It's going to change your life if and you're so not you already doing it. you mean by batching, it. you mean by the schedule of time. Yes. So when I'm writing, there's a few things. I'm always writing notes in my phone. So I'm always writing notes and organizing them into social, um, potential emails coming up. And I'll do voice notes because that's easiest for me. I'm not saying that would be best for everyone to do, but for me, if I am in an experience or I'm at an event and there's something that I want to note because I think it would be great to weave into an email or a future piece of content, I'll just make a quick voice memo and then I'll get those transcribed through rev.com and that often becomes the foundation of our content. So I do a lot of dictation. Mm. Even when I'm about to write a book, I go back through all of these voice notes and I start to put them all together. I start to weave them together. And that has been one of the, I would say that is my best practice tip that I could offer to anybody because I find it so much easier to just cool. record voice notes and get them transcribed. I do this when I'm telling stories. If I'm if I'm out or even if I'm doing an interview, I'll often get things transcribed so that I can use it for future pieces of content. So, so you're big on repurposing, repurposing as yeah. well. Okay, okay, cool. So best piece of advice you've ever received? I know that's big. Best piece of advice I've ever received. <laughs> I asked Richard Branson if he could go back to when he was 30 years old, I was 30 at the time, I was like, what, what would you, like, what were you doing at the time? What should I be doing? I wanna make sure that I'm like setting myself up for success and for longevity. And he looked at me and he was like, you know, you're, you're doing just fine. You've <laughs> figured a lot of things out. You may even be more successful than I was at age 30. You just need to have fun. <laughs> like you, you don't need to, you don't need to put so much pressure on yourself. And that was just a sigh of relief and, mm. and being on, being on Necker Island, his home and, and seeing how he lives his life and how he plays made me want to play a lot more and have a lot more fun and not take everything so seriously. And that was the beginning stages of what has been a very profound transformation in my life where I will stop working before the sun is going down and go play at Muscle Beach in Santa Monica and just like swing on swings and watch the sunset and put my feet in the sand. And I didn't give myself permission to do that before. Yeah, right. So fun is becoming an increasingly more important part of your life. It's, that is one of the best pieces of advice I've, I've ever got is to just, mm. you have to have fun with all of it. If it's not fun, you shouldn't be doing it. There has to be a joy there. And when you lose that, you've lost. So I've, I've really taken that on in my life and in my business. And if you could go back to your 18 year old self and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? My 18 year old self was uh, confident, but the confidence was often a mask and she had a lot of insecurities and wanted people to like her and watered herself down and filtered herself in order to be liked and to get respect from people. And I would, and I, I also at that age was coming out of a relationship with the boy that I thought was the love of my life, <laughs> like teenage first love and he, he, when I was 18, started dating one of my close friends and that just destroyed me for a little while. 
And so if I could go back to 18, I would, I would tell my 18 year old self to just be, like, be unapologetically you mm. and know that you don't have to, you don't have to filter yourself. Not everyone's gonna like you, that's okay. Um, and that you are so like smart and amazing and any, any boy who does not see that is just, you know, he's not, he's not for you. He's not for so you. I got very hung up on that as well. And I think we just doubt ourselves more when we're, when we're younger. And I would just let her know that all of her dreams came true. <laughs> like I would just hold her yeah. sobbing on her bed, Until thinking about how gonna she was okay. going to end up in California. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to go to school in California, which I we could not afford for me to go to school in in California. And I I knew I wanted to live here, though. I knew I wanted to start a business. I wanted an amazing relationship. There were so many things that I desired at the time and felt an enormous pressure around that. And also this sense of urgency of like, I really have to get on this and I have to get on it right now. And yeah, I would just hold her and tell her all her dreams came true. Like here mm. I am, I'm in California. I moved my businesses here. I have my business, I'm living my dream life. It's pretty cool. It's very cool. <laughs> so for people who want to find out more about you, like tell us about all the books, all the courses, like what have you done? What have we got? All the things, all the things. Um, you can find me at shetakesontheworld.com, of course, if you want to identify some of your habits that are not serving you and replace them with better ones, you can go to fivebadhabits.com and and download that checklist, which I feel will be a good one for a lot of people yeah, right. listening. Start to transform your habits and your routines and incorporate more rituals into your life. And you can find me on social media everywhere at Natalie McNeil. And that's M-A-C-N-E-I-L. And I'd love to love to connect with all of you further. And what's next for Natalie McNeil? What is next for Natalie McNeil? This book. I know book, the book. You got the book? The book I'm so excited about yeah. because it is, it moves me into a different direction. It's more transformational work and it's more in the personal development space while still really serving the audience that I have already built. I'm also working on something incredible with Alexi Panos right now, who I know has been a guest of yours as well. And we're working on something that brings me back to my interactive media roots. And one of the coolest things I've experienced recently is getting to see why I did all these things in my life. So <laughs> over the last hour, we've been talking about how I was in marketing and did all these interactive media projects and documentary films and she takes on the world and writing books. And there have been so many times where I've been like, why do I feel so drawn to this one thing? Like, why am I not just focused on one specific thing? Why do I, I feel so strongly pulled over here and then over here in what we're creating next in this next chapter for me, everything is integrated. Mm. And I love what Steve Jobs said about how you can only connect the dots looking backwards. backwards. And yeah. you have to trust mm. that everything is forming this bigger, this bigger tapestry, that it, it does all have meaning. And I can see the meaning in all of it now. And that feels like wow. an amazing place to be. Full where circle. I'm going is very different than where I've been. It's very, the last 10 years are very integrated within me now. Yeah. And I just feel like powerful and wild and alive <laughs> and so ready to take on the world Girl, in brand you are new ways. Unstoppable. You literally <laughs> are unstoppable. Natalie McNeil, thank you so much for coming into Unstoppable. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for your time. 
Thank you. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor. Don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say. And your reviews make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media at Kerwin Ray.